will be now known as William Deshaun Hamilton. We want to give him that respect that he deserves and the respect that is warranted. You see, there were individuals that loved him. But there was one individual that failed him. And she failed him miserably. And it was the one individual that was supposed to love him unconditionally. And yet, and instead, she discarded him as if he was trash and left him in a wooded area to slowly be composed to the point where no one is able to discover who he was for over 23 years. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what happened here. And when we all first spoke with you during jury selection, we told you that this defendant was presumed innocent unless until proven guilty, right? And I'm going to get to that, but I wanted to make sure that this is the individual we're going to talk about today. This is the individual, William Deshaun Hamilton, that was left in the woods. This individual is the reason why this defendant is standing before you today. Innocent unless and until it is proven guilty. And that presumption is only there until it is overcome by evidence. Evidence that you heard from the witness stand, evidence that you heard through exhibits, through videos. Once that presumption is overcome by evidence, then they are no longer presumed innocent. That is done. It is gone. The state has the burden of proof in this case. And that's a burden that we take on. We have the highest burden of proof within our judicial system. And we have to prove each and every material allegation of this indictment beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, what is reasonable doubt? That's important. The burden is important in this case because it tells you how you can review the evidence and make decisions based off of the evidence. So let me tell you what reasonable doubt is. It actually sounds as ironically as it says. A doubt for which a reason can be given is based off your common sense and reason. So during jury selection, we were telling you, we understand that your experiences cannot be left outside. Your experiences make you who you are and it helps you to learn what is common sense and what is not. So we didn't expect you to leave your outside experiences at the door. We expect you to use those experiences so you can be able to make inferences and reasonable deductions when you are reviewing the evidence. What reasonable doubt is not it is not any possibility. There are millions of possibilities that anyone can come up with. The question is whether or not there is a doubt that is reasonable that goes to the essential elements of the crime to which the state has to prove. It is not vague and it is not arbitrary and I do not have to prove to a mathematical certainty. I don't have to say this is 100% guilty, this is 99% guilty. That is not how reasonable doubt works is not to a mathematical certainty. Your job as jurors is to not search for doubt. We asked you during jury selection, can you be fair? Can you be impartial? Because that, what, that is what a juror is, is a fair and impartial juror who is honestly seeking the truth as to what happened to William between December 1st, 1998 and February 26th, 1999. That is your duty, and that is what the state is calling upon you to decide in an impartial and a fair manner who wants to know the truth about what happened to William between December 1st, 1998 and February 26th, 1999. So I want to ask you, 
when we speak about reasonable doubt, let's think about it this way. Is it reasonable that this defendant who knew something was wrong with her son William for a few days, who observed the following symptoms of her son over a few days, lethargic, weak, tired, gagging, didn't want to talk, didn't want to walk, didn't want to do anything. Is it reasonable for a parent to see these symptoms for a few days and not seek medical attention? I submit to you the answer is not. Parent may see one symptom, maybe two, but you have seven different symptoms up here that this child is experiencing over a period of few days and that came from this defendant's mouth and she failed to seek medical attention. And because of that, William is no longer here with us today. The state also has to prove venue. Venue is the location where we can say the crime happened. We are here, venue is DeKalb County. We have to prove that this case, that venue relies on DeKalb County. I want to let you know that if a dead body is discovered in this state and it cannot be readily determined in what county the cause of death was inflicted, venue is proper and may be proved in a county in which the dead body was discovered. I submit to you, and I'm gonna say it now, that the state does not believe that William Hamilton died in that wooded area and laid there for decomposition. I submit to you that William was driven there and dumped in the woods with his Timberland boots on, double knotted as defense counsel stated, and left there. We know he didn't sleep there from a plethora of reasons, but one that was very, very important was that canned bottle that had his shoe imprint in the wooded area. Is it common sense to believe that he slept on that canned bottle when he went to sleep that night because the indention of the canned bottle was that of his boots. I submit to you that if he slept there, meaning that Teresa, this defendant, and William got off a bus and they walked to a location in the, in the wooded area to get off the street and slept on pine straw during the cold, when she previously advised you that she slept on park benches, that she slept in the park and at bus stops, she's not gonna go to a wooded area full of pine straw to go to sleep. And William's leg is not gonna be so comfortable that his boot is sitting on a can while he's resting. So I submit to you that this body was dumped in this wooded area in our jurisdiction in DeKalb County, and that is where venue lies. There's also another portion of venue that we have to prove as well. In any case in which it cannot be determined in what county a certain crime was committed, Venue is proper and may be proved in any county in which the evidence shows beyond a reasonable doubt that it might have been committed. So I want to talk to you about, uh, I'm going to touch on briefly and I'm going to come back to it, but concealment of the death, right? She concealed it and she lied about it. She placed the body in the wood area. She told you she either took a jacket or a sweater, and she laid it on top of him, covering up his body. 
concealing. And then she lied about it. She lied about it continuously <coughs> over and over and over again. And the lie started at the very beginning. <coughs> the lie started when she made that phone call to Ava from a payphone. And I submit to you that during her statement, she stated when she got here, she was living in the Decatur area. And she used a payphone, and she stated that William was in a room with friends, and, that, and that's why Ava couldn't speak to her. But she told you all through her statement that she lived in the Decatur area, which is in DeKalb County. There's no area outside of Decatur, Georgia, that is not located in DeKalb County. And she told Ava a lie. She told Ava, oh, William, he's in the room with my friends. She just got to Atlanta. What friends she got? She don't know nobody. William did. And at that moment, she told a lie, started a cycle of lies and continued the lies for decades. But the lie began in the cabin with Ava. And so I have to prove that venue lies in the cab in reference to that charge as well. And I want to go ahead and kind of give you all a preview of that information as we progress on through the closing argument. So here's the location where William was found. Right? And you heard from multiple witnesses that the body was located somewhere along this wooded area. There is a path, and you can actually see a vehicle right here. There is a path in which cars can travel within that wooded area. And here is an entire cemetery that ironically this defendant never saw when she told you all she slept there. And then she stayed there for a day or two watching over William as he lie there dead, she never noticed there was an entire cemetery there. And you tell this jury that you've been there for over 24 hours watching your dead son. So then, let's talk about her intent. I want to be clear. In order for the state to prove intent, which we have to do, I want the jurors to know that it may be inferred from proven circumstances by any acts or conduct. I can prove this defendant's intent through her actions, through her conduct. And in your discretion, you can also infer logical conclusions about her acts or conduct, and you can look at it and see if her actions or conduct results in a natural and necessary consequence of those acts. So for example, this defendant gives her child some medicine, some acetaminophen and dihydramine because there may be issues going on or because she needs him to sleep. And then he begins to exhibit symptoms from these drugs. And she tells you in her statement, I will give him anything I can find. She subsequently over medicates him you can draw the logical conclusion that that medication that was also found in his skeletal tissue, coupled with her statement that she gave him the drugs, without seeking medical attention, you can infer that the logical result of those, of that conduct, can result in death. Criminal intent does not mean the intention to violate the law. We don't have to prove that she intended to kill William. We only have to prove that her actions were prohibited by law. And her actions in her failing to seek medical attention for her son, knowing that he has these symptoms that he had been exhibiting in her care for a few days and failed to get attention when she, are, she is now dealing with something that's outside her expertise, right? When you're sick, you got a cold, you'll take some medicine. 
and hopefully you'll take the prescribed dosage as notated on the medication. But if you don't get better, you don't continue to take the medicine, and as you continue to deteriorate, you won't not go to the doctor or seek any kind of medical attention to get better. That's unreasonable, especially when you're six years old and you can't do it yourself. You have to depend on the person who took you from your family, who uprooted you, moved you to a new state, and that is the only person that you got to depend on. So at six, he can't do it himself. And so this defendant, who is his parent, has the obligation to make sure the safety and welfare of her son is accounted for. And by doing so, when things of this nature happen, you need to seek medical attention. And if you fail to do so, the natural and necessary consequence of that action can result in death. You heard a testimony from, from several doctors that at any point in time, <coughs> when these medicines are in the system and there's a level where it becomes toxic, you can get medical care and you can live. But if you fail to do so, the consequence of your actions can result in death. So I don't have to prove that she intended to kill him, but I have to prove that she intended to not get him medical attention. She intended to not get him medical attention because she didn't. She intended to give him medicine. She continued to give him medicine, and he, he obtained a level of toxicity to the point where it caused his death. Intention, proven. She gave him medicine, it's in his system. She didn't seek medical attention, she told you that. Those are the two acts that I need to prove in reference to this defendant, not that she intended to kill him. Witnesses came on this stand and it's you, your job to observe their credibility. When observing their credibility, you have to gauge their manner how they testify, their interests or lack thereof in this case, their means and opportunity of knowing the facts about which they testify, the nature and the facts about which they testify, the probability or improbability of their testimony and their credibility as you observe it. This incident happened in 1999. Ava came to you all and took the stand. What did she gain from it by taking the stand? What did she gain from it by telling you what she knew? She told you several things, plenty of things about this case. William Hamilton, he testified. He told you, I tried to see my son on many occasions. She wouldn't let me. She even put a gun out on me when I came to see my son. I just wanted to see my son. I wanted him to be a part of my life, my family's life. His grandmother, Margaret, told you, I love my grandbaby. I would have done anything for him. I would have taken care of him if given the opportunity. I took care of six of my grandchildren at one time. <coughs> what did they have to gain from their testimony other than just telling you the truth? What do they get the benefit just by coming here and speaking to you? And if you seem to, if you determine that these individuals are credible, then you can believe what they say. And I want to be very clear that whenever one witness testifies and you believe them, that establishes fact. 
The yeah. state does not have to prove or corroborate any witness statement. If you determine the facts from one witness and one witness alone to be the truth or to be a fact in this case, and that is it. I don't have to corroborate any additional fact to make it true. So when Ava told you that she met Teresa in 1995 and they hung out every single day, got up in the morning, smoked a little weed before they went to work, went to work, got off work, she played with William every day. And then Teresa ups and leaves and comes to Atlanta, Georgia. She calls her one time and never calls her again. One time in Atlanta and never calls her again. That is a fact. And that's a very, very important fact. Because when you are best friends with someone and you talk to them every single day and that best friend loves your child, and it's unquestioned, undisputed how much Ava loved that child. She loved him so much that she was the only one who fought for him. And they weren't even by watching him connect. She trusted, Teresa trusted Ava around her child. Ava asked every day, where's, where's my baby? How my baby doing? Even when she witnessed this defendant abuse her child. She told you on two different occasions. She punched him in the chest one time, and then the second time when he didn't like her food, she threw him across the room. Those facts were given to you by Ava and Ava only. If you determine those facts to be true, then they are facts and that is, that is enough. Evidence. So there are two kinds of evidence, and it's very important. One does not outweigh the other. They are weighed equally. You have direct evidence, and then you have circumstantial evidence. Direct evidence is what you heard from the witness stand. Exhibits. Things you can see. Things you can hear. Videos. Interviews. That's direct evidence. <coughs> circumstantial evidence is a proof or set of facts and circumstances that tend to prove or disprove another fact by inference. Jurors, you are allowed to make logical inferences based off the facts that you learned in this case. Inference number one. Gary Harris, individual who lived on Clifton Springs Road, who worked night shifts, staying at his brother's house, came here after the Olympics. He was resting in his bedroom because he lives with his brother at the time and he was sleeping in his nephew's room. He hears something around 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning. He hears a door. He looks out of the window, sees the inside of the car light on, and sees another door closed. And then it drives off. And he tells you that that was so odd because nobody is out in the woods at 4 o'clock in the morning over in this area, and it's cold. And it's so cold that the next day he wanted to go investigate and see what was going on, but never went out there. And then subsequently, the news came on and the remains were found in that wooded area. You can make logical conclusions that based off that series of facts, that it was highly probable and highly likely that's when William's body was getting dumped in the woods. You have the ability to make those inferences through circumstantial evidence. There is no legal difference between direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. The law does not require any higher or greater degree of certainty. on the part of the jury to return a verdict based upon circumstantial evidence than upon direct evidence. You can base this whole entire case off circumstantial evidence and you can find this defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. You see, the test is whether there is sufficient evidence 
or whether evidence is sufficiently convincing to satisfy you that the elements have been that the elements of each additional of each the material elements of each additional count have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Whether it be direct evidence or circumstantial evidence, it doesn't matter. It's evidence. There is no rule that either direct evidence or circumstantial evidence is stronger than the other if conflicting. The comparative weight of circumstantial evidence and direct evidence on any given issue is a question of fact. And that question of facts lies with the jury. There are six counts in the indictment. These counts form the issues to which you are to decide here today. You have count one, felony murder, which is count one as well as count three. Count two and four are cruelty to children. Count five is aggravated assault. And count six is concealment of death. I want to speak to you first in reference to count one, felony murder. There are two ways the state of Georgia charges murder. You have malice murder, which is not being charged here today. And you have felony murder. Now, malice murder is the typical murder that everyone knows. A person who commits malice murder has the intent to kill. They pick up a gun, they point it, fire, pile, shoot the individual, they die. Or they take a knife and they deliberately stab an individual and that individual dies. They have the intent to kill. And that is malice murder. Felony murder is totally different. It's not that and that's not what we have charged as defendants. Felony murder is that when someone causes the death of another person by committing a felony. You commit a felony and as a result of that felony, someone dies. So count one is charged that this defendant did commit the death of William Hamilton, a human being, by failing to seek medical treatment for William. The failing to seek medical treatment for William is the basis of the cruelty to children count. So that is the felony. So the cruelty to children committed a crime ultimately resulting in the death of William. Count two, the cruelty to children, just to reiterate, did maliciously cause William Hamilton, her child, cruel or excessive physical or mental pain by failing to seek medical treatment for William Hamilton. The essential elements of cruelty to children are as follows. Maliciously caused, cruel or excessive physical or mental pain to a child under the age of 18. Count three is also felony murder. And count three is that this defendant did cause the death of William Hamilton, a human being, by administering a substance or substances containing diphenhydramine and acetamin, also known as Benadryl and Tylenol. Again, for felony murder, caused the death of another by committing a felony. The felony in count three is also cruelty to children, but it's a different count. It is count four. Did cause cruel or excessive physical or mental pain by administering a substance or substances containing diphenhydramine and acetamin. So, I want to speak with you in reference to maliciously caused. Because malicious seems like a really, really, oh man, I maliciously attacked someone. That is not the legal jargon or the legal definition of malicious in this case. 
Malicious is not ill will. It is not hatred. We're not saying that she hated women. Disconnected, sure. Love, questionable. But we're not stating that it was ill will or hatred. Malice is the intent to cause pain without justification or excuse. Willfully doing an act while aware of the strong likelihood that pain may result. Dr. Jackson told you all that he was a toxicologist that he received two samples of skeletal muscle or skeletal muscle from the DeKalb County Medical Examiner's offices and he tested that muscle for any therapeutic and illicit drugs. And during his test, he discovered that it was 93 milli micrograms per gram of acetaminophen and 2,000 nanograms of dihydrogen. It is clear that those drugs were in William's system and Dr. Jackson told you that they were administered at least shortly before death. He cannot tell you the do dosage, whether it was a lethal amount of dosage or a level of toxicity, given the fact that he only had that sample. He didn't have any other factors. He was not aware of any symptoms the victim were, were, was experiencing at the time. So we know for sure that William was in this defendant's care and those drugs were in his system. You can now infer that this defendant gave him those drugs. Knowing that he is now experiencing these symptoms, she continues to give the drugs and she tells you that he can't walk, that he can't talk. When someone can't walk and can't talk, it is logical for you to infer that that is painful. And it then carry on for a few days. That becomes cruel. That is not. The fact that she gave these drugs, observed these symptoms, and allowed him to continue to suffer, that is the maliciousness of the cruelty to children count. And as he suffers continuously without getting the medical attention, that is cruel or excessive. I don't have to prove both. I just have to prove one or the other, cruel or excessive. So however you determine it, whether it be cruel that a six-year-old suffers continuously and continues to exhibit these symptoms that his mother sees and fails to get him attention, that's for you to decide. For a person who can't walk, who can't talk, who is gagging, who doesn't want to do anything, it's physical pain. And William was six years old at the time of his death. Those are the elements, the essential elements that the state has to prove and the state has proven to you in reference to the cruelty to children count. And because he dies as a result of the diphenhydramine and acetaminophen in his system, that's how we get to felony murder. He dies because he has these drugs in his system. He's exhibiting these symptoms, and this defendant doesn't get him medical treatment. And because of that, he dies. That's how we get to the other felony murder. Count five is aggravated assault. This is the count where the state feels they have proven beyond circumstantial evidence that this defendant assaulted William with an offensive weapon. Offensive weapon can be anything. It's unknown to us at what type of weapon was used. But I submit to you this, undisputed that William had a fracture in his zygomatic bone. 
Dr. Gower referred, referred to it as the jawbone. So I'm going to refer to it as the jawbone because zygomatic, I say that three times, I'm going to, it's not going to come out right. The jawbone is fractured. And each and every medical expert that came into this, and into this courtroom and testified tells you that it is a possibility that that fracture could have been a result of blunt force trauma. No one could rule it out, not even a defendant's expert. In fact, she conceded that there was a probability that that fracture could have been a result of blunt force trauma. What was also telling about that same fracture is that there were no gnawing marks, no scratch marks, no clawing marks from animal scavengers. There were other parts of William's skeletal bones, but none where that fracture was. And that was very important. That was very important information provided by the anthropologist that there was no gnawing, no scratching of that of that part of the of the bone. So therefore, we submit to you that that was that bone being fractured was not a result of animal scavenging. Ava told you as she watched her interaction with Teresa and William while they were together every day. It seemed to be a disconnection. This defendant was not connected to William. She, she had two incidents where Ava observed where she struck William. She punched him, and then she pushed him one time just because he didn't even like what she cooked. And this was before he died. And he died at the age of six. And she hit a kid who was no older than six years old because he didn't like her food. Margaret Hamilton told you that there was a period in time when this defendant was not around William. And when she came back into his life, she had some concerns. She had concerns about the welfare of William. And that is telling. You know what is also telling to me? That I hope you all uh, recognize as well. Throughout everything you heard from this defendant's statement to that witness stand, I never heard anything, including her statement, that she loved with. She never said it, not one time. She was concerned about herself and saying, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't know what to do. Not once did she say, did she say I loved my son. <clears throat> I submit to you, she may have struck him, just like she did on the previous occasion, caused that fracture. He's sick. He dies. She has something to hide. Dumps the body in a wooded area, in a location that she's not familiar with, not known to be around. She got out. And what's even more ironic about the disconnection between her and William is that on his first birthday after his death, she was at the DMV getting an ID card. The first murder, I mean the first birthday of William's murder, she is getting her ID card down at the DMV. That's the level of disconnection this mother had for her son William. The last count in this indictment is concealing the death of another. What I have, what the state has to prove is that 
This defendant concealed the death of another person, which hindered the discovery of whether that person was unlawfully killed. We charge this count in, in two ways. You see here it says, did unlawfully conceal the death of William Hamilton which hindered the discovery of whether William Hamilton was unlawfully killed by leaving the body of William Hamilton in a wooded area and about lying, where his, lying about his whereabouts. The law is a little funny, right? Let me tell you about that, that little word and in that indictment. You see, it, re it really reads and or, and or, and means or, right? I don't have to prove both. I just have to prove one or the other. I have to prove that she concealed his death by either leaving the body in a wooded area or by lying about it. We've proven it both ways, but I still just want you all to be familiar with how the law works and explain it a little bit to you. Leaving the body in a wooded area, she tells you herself, I left him in a wooded area. Off the street, we walked up, tell you he was sleeping for the night there. I humbly disagree. But nevertheless, she laid him in a wooded area. She also told you that she either took a jacket or a sweater and she covered him up. That is very important because now you're covering up the body, further concealing the death of the remains. And it's in her statement. And if you didn't hear it, you have every opportunity to ask to listen to it again. That's totally your option. If you need to hear it, just let us know. We will happily play it for you. We don't have to play the entire portion of the interview. We can only play whatever parts you need to hear. But this defendant told you that she laid that jacket or sweater, either it was hers or something William had, laid it on top. Wooded area in a location where she's not familiar with, nowhere near William is from, no family nearby, and she left. And that body laid there until it was discovered by Mr. Parker and Mr. Carter, the two grave diggers, on February 26, 1999. She also lied about it. I'm gonna tell you again the conversation she had with Ava <coughs> when she got to Atlanta, Ava told you all it was roughly about a week. <coughs> a few days had passed. She felt she was at a payphone because she could hear the change dropping. And at that time, Ava knew William wasn't with her. And this defendant also confirmed that by saying he's in the room with my friend. and then Ava never heard from her again until she ran into her in Charlotte. At this time, William is long dead. William was dead when that conversation was made. Because, think about this. Your best friend, you talk to every day, at your house, every day. And in an instant, no contact, none. Logical inference in that knowing that Ava loved, loved William, asked about William on that phone. She couldn't stomach it, but she didn't call him. Either way you put it, whether you consider it concealing the death by putting William in a wooded area, covering him up with a jacket or a sweater leaving them there for the maggots, and then lying to Ava, and then continuously lying to Ava, because Ava continuously asked, where was William? She never let up, and thank God she didn't, because now we can get the respect and justice that he truly deserves. We would have never figured out who he was, and she would have been successful in concealing that death. By the time 
Law enforcement found the body, it was fully decomposed. We couldn't even tell if it was a boy or a girl. We couldn't even tell the color, nationality, nothing. We can only make assumptions because he had some Timberland boots that were double knotted and some boys' underwear. Ladies and gentlemen, quite honestly, that's almost how you consider death. But for the fact that you have a best friend who just so happens to love your child more than you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm getting ready to sit down for a second and then defense counsel is going to come up here. I'm going to suggest that he's going to tell you that this may have been an unfortunate mishap. That this defendant was young. that she didn't know what to do. But I disagree. She made a conscious decision in every action and in her conduct. She made a conscious decision to leave Charlotte with no family here in Georgia at 18 years of age got on a bus and brought William here when there were multiple people more than willing to care for William until she got on her feet. But she didn't want that. She didn't want them. She didn't want William with any of his paternal relatives. And one of the reasons was because William Sr had another child that he just so happened to name Deshaun. She gets here, she gets a drive at Queens and Strippin, and she tells you she takes all kinds of drugs under the sun, whatever they give her. Marijuana, whatever's in the pills, cocaine, didn't matter she took. And she has a six-year-old son here with her. She then begins to medicate him. He gets sick. And she made a conscious decision to continue giving him the medication. And she makes a conscious decision to not give him help when he so desperately needs it. Those are not mishaps. Those are in oh my goodness, I knew something was wrong and I didn't do it, but I shouldn't be held responsible. No. She is responsible. And she needs to be held accountable. And my co-counsel is going to come up here after the defendant gives you his closing argument. And she's going to give the final remarks. And she's going to ask you to do what justice requires. She's going to actually return a verdict of guilty in all counts of this indictment. 